So we talked to Greg last night, and not only are we helping build and teach Tim, Stan, and his gang how to install an incredible water feature, but we're also gonna put the finishing touches on it to help coach them, as well as you guys out there, how to landscape around water. We always talk about it being the last 10% and probably the most important 10% of just tying everything back together. It's that softscape that really marries the terrestrial plants and the surrounding landscape in with the water feature, making it look like it's always been there. So we're gonna pick out a handful of signature plants, really put the bones in, and then when it warms up out here, Tim, right, things start to bud out and get some leaves, then maybe you can fill in some of the little gaps in between, but we're gonna get some of those foundational plants today and talk about some of the different ideas and elements that we do when landscaping around water. We are gonna build a pondless waterfall. The easiest way to learn something is to teach it. We are rocking and rolling on this pond. We appreciate you guys tuning in. I think one thing after putting the pond together yesterday is we really want to find a handful of low growing evergreen plants that will kind of soften up the edges and really transition out into the existing landscape. We talk about it all the time. This is a great key phrase for you to use with your customers, but also you guys out there. The most successful water features are the ones that you can't tell where the land stops and the water begins. So we really want to marry the two areas together seamlessly. And that's where some of those edge water transitional plants really come into play in our area and I think for you guys up here in this zone some of those low growing junipers would do great those are the ones that stay about six eight inches tall and really spread out three four five six feet and just start crawling over the rocks and then we'll transition up into some taller stuff back behind it looks like we're pretty close to where we need to be this place is enormous Tim, these are some of those evergreens. These are what, the Nana junipers? Brian has them around his pond. If some of you guys have seen the Brian's Backyard video, he's got a couple of these and they really take off and spread horizontally without getting too tall. So some of those areas yesterday where we talked about putting something green in the landscape without blocking the waterfall, these would be ideal. A couple of these might be a really good selection along the edge. And then what's also great about them is they're green year round. So as you're running that stream and waterfalls throughout the season, these might be a really excellent addition along those edges. And then we'll kind of layer out from there. So full size, what do you, how big do these end up getting? You know, these will end up getting three, four, sometimes six feet if they're allowed to grow that far, which is really awesome because you're getting a lot of impact relatively small plants and it will happen over a relatively short period of time. And what we really want to do is, is not put them all together so they end up being one big mass. One here, one over there, which is not typically common in a landscape design. You want to do things in mass to really strengthen it. But with these, I think if we kind of strategically place them around the edges, it's really going to sharpen things up. I'm just thinking. It'd be great to get one kind of down here by the skimmer and probably on that side just to help fill that space. But then I picture another one up here and then maybe another one here and then maybe one back over by these rocks. We'll just have to kind of wait and see. But up here would be great, this space, for like an understory, multi-stem ornamental, all right? Just something that'll have kind of this branching canopy to kind of scale it down because the timber and stuff goes so far back that you want to bring a little bit of height forward into the foreground to help carry your eye past everything. Does that make sense? Yep. some of those staple evergreens that are going to stay really low and really start to blend the two pieces together meaning the existing landscape and the water feature which is why we got those low growing evergreens those nana junipers you want to be careful with some of the junipers there are some junipers that will get six eight feet 12 feet tall by the same amount wide you want to make sure you're getting the right variety so those are those really low growing ones but we're going to also try and find a little bit more evergreen interest again to provide that year-round bone structure to the landscape. 
So if we can find something like a spreading U that'll get four or five feet tall um, that we'll put along the backside of the berm and then maybe we'll mix in some tall deciduous shrubs mixed in with that that'll get maybe six, seven feet tall just to help funnel all that energy back towards the house and get a good mix of deciduous and evergreen. We don't want to go all evergreen and have it look like a specimen bonsai garden. You always want to have a little bit of contrast in foliage as well as size and structure as well. sufficient back there for the space that we have right now we can obviously do a few more but i don't think it's necessary yet because you still have all that really cool fun space for your kids to play in back i don't want to overtake the yard by over landscaping it so i think three of these spreading use that'll get four to six feet wide but only stay about three to four feet tall will be good intermediate shrub to put kind of around the back side of the berm to help funnel all that stuff all that visual and audible interest back but carry your eye past that origin point of the biofalls that makes sense that's those junipers that we were just talking about. Can you guys see them up on that back wall? See how tall they are? I mean, they've gotta only be six, eight inches above those rocks, but see how those branches, and those probably haven't been maintained at all, but how those branches are crawling over the rocks, and you can still see the semblance of the rocks underneath, but those branches crawl over, and then they start to swoop down. It's such a cool effect. Can you imagine water coming right up to the edge of those rocks? Obviously, we're not gonna grab that many for you, but that's the look. It's on a much smaller scale. Yeah. That's a perfect representation of how it crawls over the rocks and you're not sure how far back those rocks go um, or even the water goes in some of those areas. Well, they have a spring flower. They also fruit. Birds love them. They also have a brilliant fall color. And that red, that dark red like we saw with the amber flame. I didn't even see these, but I might almost go with something like this instead of that. Okay. You get a little bit more interest out of it throughout more of the year different seasons of interest. There's always something that helps strengthen the landscape design, especially if you have people like a customer that loves bird, that kind of stuff. So any kind of fruiting tree, um, virtually any kind of fruiting tree or shrub will always bring the birds in. And now that you have the flowing water, you're already gonna get that right. inhabitants of wildlife. Yeah, birds you know? are already moving in. Yeah, are they? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, awesome. Them. Yep. So maybe something like this would be a better choice or selection. Let's take a walk this way and kind of see. Okay. Chris, what do you think of a service berry, one of these autumn brilliance? I didn't see any multi-stem red buds. This will give them that four seasons of interest yeah. and get about the same height. Especially if that elm comes down, you're gonna want color to pop to transition against your screening in the back, the woods. Yeah. I love service berries, man. I'm clearing out some of the woods too. I mean, yeah. the buckthorn get a in and bush hog through there, that'd yeah, be awesome. I'll just, I'm gonna rip it up with the day. Like, no red buds? I can't find it. Are they on your map? No, these are all the trees over here. Oh. Yeah. I didn't see any. The closest thing I saw to, as far as like a multi-stem are those amber flames right over there. The yeah. ones that have the leaves on them. There's some lilacs in front of them, but these service berries are ready to bud. These will pop. They're going to bloom yeah. too soon. I'd like you do one of them or three. I would do one just on that left side behind those big rocks. And then I think if we can go over to the shrubs and just find like some four foot viburnums yeah. or okay. something to kind of do a little serpentine do like five of them on that right side and then I've got some spreading used to go in the back side of the berm. about this just like ponds is you kind of adapt right the artistic vision and coming out here we knew we wanted to maybe target one or two specimen kind of anchor funky plants just to kind of focus your attention but add a little bit more zest and pop to the landscape and I don't think many plants offer that more than like the Louisa crabs right these are like those cool keystone plants it's like a one piece in the garden that everybody's like oh that is awesome right
right? Where it's melted in with a lot of the other plantings in mass to give that overall strength of the design. But these are those funky signature plants that really take it to the next level. So I really like this one. You can see it's got kind of those two liters. And the cool thing about this is it's gonna spread out and grow down. It's at smaller height. It wasn't something that I anticipated on thinking about figuring into the design. But when we got out here and we started looking at the space back in our photos on our phones of your pond, this would be perfect over on that right hand side, I think. questions. Tim was just asking about, do we need to amend the soil? Occasionally you'll have to. This is all good virgin black soil. It's sandy, provide good drainage, harvested elsewhere here on the property. So it's great. One thing to consider when digging the holes for the root balls is dig them about one and a half times the size of the root ball. And the reason you want to do that is you allow yourself that extra space all the way around the root ball. It will allow you to manipulate the tree, twist it, turn it without kind of knocking around the inside portion of the hole. But what it'll also help is you to get some of that excavated soil back around the root ball it's already loose you don't want to over compact it uh, but you also want to make sure it's compact so you don't have a bunch of air gaps in that backfilled soil to allow for that root growth as the tree starts to take off you can notice over here that the root ball itself is wrapped in plastic they do this in a lot of nursery applications in order to hold the moisture inside the root ball but then it's just a big burlap sack around that root ball after they spade it a lot of times what they'll also do is they'll have this cage. What I like to do is obviously get rid of the plastic. You don't want to leave that on there. I will leave the burlap sack and occasionally pull off the basket itself. It's not 100% necessary because this burlap is biodegradable. It will break down and what will happen is those roots will start to go horizontally and go through the basket. You can take the basket off but sometimes when we get plants, especially from the Michigan side of our growing territory, it's real sandy so those root balls just crumble apart. So we'll leave the basket on. Those roots will still be able to filter their way out horizontally into the soil but when you do that you just want to make sure that you pull these top rings down so that you can get this top layer of burlap off but when we're digging our hole it's important to dig the hole at the proper depth so often I either see trees planted too deep or way too shallow and then they just have that volcano of mulch there's a root flare at the base of the tree and we'll show that when we get the tree down in the hole but it's typically two to three inches below where the base of the trunk starts to flare back out and go into that root structure when they grow 
these trees in nurseries, they start off a lot of times as whips, meaning a very, very small tree itself. Then they put them in the ground and then pile soil up around them and a lot of times stake them. And what happens is as they till up the nursery fields and get rid of a lot of the weeds as they're maintaining their nursery grounds, that soil gets turned up and then starts getting pushed over and will pile up against the trunks of the trees. Sometimes when you cut off this top thing of burlap, you pull this back, you'll take a good four to six inches of soil off of the top of the root ball to really expose that root flare. So I'll show you what I mean by that. In here, you'll notice that there's a bunch of fresh soil up along the base. So when you start seeing the hair-like roots down in through here that are coming at the base of the tree, that's when you can really stop. Those are those feeder roots. This one's actually pretty good. So you just wanna kind of make sure that there's not an excess of soil wrapped up around the base of the tree. So occasionally when you pull the burlap back, you sometimes have to take some of that soil off. So when you do that, you can come over here with your spade or your tape measure and kind of just get a simple height for what the depth of your your hole needs to be. Make sure you're going off of where the root flare is, not how tall it is from the soil to the bottom of the soil. Okay, so you found the root flare by yep. locating these fine feeder roots in here. And that should be the top, yes, the very top of the dirt. Should be level with the dirt right there. It should be a couple inches a couple above inches. existing grade, okay. right? And that'll prevent that volcanic look, but that'll prevent you from overbearing it too. Okay, so now just a rule of thumb, a couple inches, so you want it probably yep. right, about right about there. there. Huh? Yeah, we're pretty close, yep. but I think we're a little deep, so we can take some of that fluff, throw it down in the bottom, just get it nice and leveled off, and then go ahead and get our tree in there. When handling the root balls, what you want to avoid is like beating these things, right? There's still feeder roots up along the top, but you still have a lot of the root structure. So when you're in nurseries, you see they have the little clamp attachment to the skidsters. So they're just using a little bit of compression, lifting those things up and gingerly placing them. You don't want to start throwing these things around because you can really damage these trees. And because the root ball is way more important than what you have going up top, right? Makes sense? So as we'll do that, we'll just kind of roll this thing out on the ground. Sometimes you strap them. It just depends. There's a lot of different methods to get the tree into the hole today. I think we're just going to get the skidster close and just kind of roll it gently into the hole and then get it upright, get our face that we want and then go ahead and start backfilling. So don't have to slice for the burlap that's going to grow, going to decompose and grow right through yep. it. But you can see it's already starting to kind of fall apart yep. in through here. But over a couple seasons that stuff will just deteriorate. And these cages are better to leave in place if depending on the depending soil on the you got. the structure of the soil around the root ball. Yep. You could destroy your root ball by taking this cage. Exactly. And then all of a sudden you have a bare root tree that's eight feet tall that you're trying to plant into a ground and that just doesn't work a lot of and times. The roots never get choked off or curdled, right? They that's should. It. They'll find their way through these big holes in the cage. Yep. It's amazing what trees will do in their roots and how they find water and that kind of stuff. So I think we can get this thing a little bit closer. Yeah. And then we'll just roll it into place. Another thing to keep an eye out for is the lasso or the rope that they use in nursery practice. A lot of times when they tie off the burlap around the trunks, you want to get rid of that stuff so it doesn't end up girdling the tree and choking it off here. So. This is an Amelanker canadensis. Autumn Brilliance, I think is the, it's, a, it's I think what they used to call it. Could be a Shadblow serviceberry, but this yeah. is a nice tree. It'll provide four seasons of interest. It's great for birds. Like we talked about at the nursery, yep. Tim, you already have birds and other wildlife coming here. It's a fruiting tree, so it'll be great for the birds in the winter. It's got a really cool spring bloom on it, white flowers, but then the fall color is second to none. So you just kind of go through the whole season and really, really enjoy this thing. And it also has that multi-stem appearance. So you can, as it matures, you can trim off a lot of these lower branches and really get that base shape or that cantilevered canopy for an understory tree back here. Oh,
amazing it turned out uh, way better than I thought I didn't picture this when we were find, trying to find the location for the mm -hmm. pond and uh, it, you picked a great spot I think it now what it's gonna do is when we got here we talked about how much you use the front yard right and now what we did is we created a destination in the backyard which is really what we talk about through the design process and maybe taking what your customers may not have originally thought of as a destination space which is what we did here right right that's the power that these ecosystem ponds and beautiful water features do is they encourage you to come back out and really interact with the space and they draw you in yeah they, they make you want to be part of this it's you guys did a fantastic job I mean the the pond that you guys built you know with with a little bit of instruction between Chris and myself turned out absolutely incredible and it's got like so much happening with it in such a small thing it's like literally taking it to its fullest potential that, that we always talk about first tell me do you have a favorite I know you were out here last night you and Melissa your wife were out here probably having a couple cocktails and enjoying it with did, did something stick out to you as being like your favorite I love the way the falls turned out I like this beach right here this is amazing I like the incorporation of the logs and the planting areas and the rock right there for the kids to hang out on even that one right there we can walk out and look in the deeper part of the water yep. at the fish I mean there's not just one part to like about it it's just got a, quite a few it, you know it's so awesome right yep. and you're gonna find yourself you're gonna have a favorite part of it and that will evolve into something else right that you'll notice when you're out here your kids are gonna have something that they enjoy about it so much more than you and it's unique to itself but it's also unique to each one of you and your family or to your guests that you bring over. And I think that's such a cool thing with water features is they offer yep. so much. You know, it's just for an eight by 11 pond with maybe a six, six and a half foot stream, just so much life that it brings to the backyard. The birds are already here and the landscaping, tying it all together, kind of finishing that softscape and marrying the two areas, the water feature and making it look like it's always been here, really, really tied it all together. Yep. It's like I said, the landscape, right? Like that was the last kind of 10%. And, and you've been to the Academy a couple times. So you've heard us harp on the importance of the softscape and marrying the two together so that you don't know where the land stops and the water begins and I think now that we've developed kind of this palette right it's not necessarily paint by numbers but we've got the low growing evergreens along the edge that will slowly cascade down into the water and pull everything together right and then you've got the layers of the deciduous stuff you've got tall vertical stuff you've got stuff that's lower and spreading you've got your beautiful signature trees right you've got the that Louisa crab that we talked about. Gosh, it's just, it's so cool. It's so, so cool. Watching Chris and Joe and Alex kind of over there, why don't we all talk and what, what did we all learn through this process? So let's go talk Sounds to good. them and see what their thoughts were, but it turned out incredible. Chris, nice yeah. work. Yo, okay. yo, nice yo. work. Good job. Okay. Good job. It's good times here. Not. What I wanted, the role of a territory sales manager at Aquascape is to give you a path right to success and so let's walk down your timeline right with meeting aquascape to owning your own water feature in the backyard we first met stanley at a hardscape north america the gie show i believe stanley dirt monkey was gie gave him his own party Whitstock comes into our booth he's like you gotta go to this party man and hang out with this guy he's so good so we met you guys there at the gie we got you into our sandbox at aquascape i heard you say you came to a few academies right and the path of dirt monkey 
or other contractors is we get you through a few methods of education, right? Your first touch would have been the Aquascape University online. Your second touch would have been the Aquascape Academy in person, right? We surround you with the networking, right? With other guys just like you trying to break in. The next step is maybe join another academy, right? Because it didn't really sink in the first time. You came back the second time. Then we put you on the path to becoming certified. And what we need you to do is all the education. You did that check. Good job. That's the hardest part. Then what we ask you to do is purchase a water feature for your own. Live with it so you can understand it. Yesterday you were beaming like when you're talking to homeowners in your office inside your home here, guess what's right over your shoulder, right through the window. They'll see that passion come through, man. It's an emotional sell, right, to the homeowner. Like I myself look forward to come home sitting with my wife in these two chairs, watching our kids play in the beach and climb all over the waterfalls. That there is what draws them in. So then what we also like you to do is reach out to your top three customers. And I don't mean your top three money-wise spent the most money with you. I mean the homeowners that can call you up whenever they need you and you're there like this, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, but they're waiting in the driveway with a cold beer because they know they're putting you out. These are the people we ask you to go back to and share your passion of why they need a water feature and live with that lifestyle. You got the eight by 11 kit. Thank you for the investment in yourself and in your team. We put it into the ground step by step. You followed the 20 steps. Chris and I were here to kind of walk you through, just show you the steps within the steps, but you took over. Stanley was making sure Joey, Alex, Blaine was in there, not us. Yep. He was forcefully getting us out of the way, which is the only way you learn. Contractors, right. by using our own two hands and leaning in, right? Now that you're working on your certification, we're gonna ask you to lean in more to only help you. All we mean by that is surround yourself with other successful water feature business owners out there that have been where you're at, step one, or with people just like you, right? Lean into the events that we have. Get more passion, get more ideas to help Dirt Monkey grow as a business. So I'm gonna put a pretty important question out there for you that you can maybe share for everybody. What was the most difficult or challenging part for Dirt Monkey? A couple of options would be, was it just starting out because this is a one year process, maybe two year process, I think? Yeah. What was a challenging part for just finally plunging into water features? It getting just, started then, I yeah, would say, yeah, right? Yeah, getting started and just feeling comfortable to do this and make sure you end up with a product like this when you break ground. You know, there's a lot that goes into these ponds. The heights of your uh, skimmer and your falls and, you know, lining that up and making sure you got no leaks on the side. And then the overall picture when you guys were in there, yeah, you want the water to swirl this way. You don't want to keep it stuck in here, so you want the water moving. It sounds you know, easy, it, but it, is it? it um, you learn it. You right? learn you gotta yeah, see it's, it's it. You got to do it. And that, yeah. that's what this this is amazing to have a experience like this and and see it you know firsthand and get down and dirty. And Chris and I have, we work with so many certified aquascape contractors. And Chris more than myself we've worked with so many contractors that are going through the certification process and really starting out. So he sees what you went through and your guys went through yesterday all the time. And you guys did an amazing job. Not just the execution but the enthusiasm I think was palpable. Right. Made it for. An easy day a super easy day yeah right and um, fun and fun you guys had everything here everything was ready all of your guys were very enthusiastic along with you and it's really really cool and encouraging to see that kind of love put into just learning something and that's so awesome you should be so proud of your team for what they did and obviously we're proud of you for finally now diving in right which is probably the hardest part is just getting started but now now you're swimming man yeah it's yep. awesome it's so awesome so you have thirteen hundred dollars for $1,400 maybe of aquascape material. You got $1,300 worth of plants, maybe a couple of hundred dollars in mulch. That price I, was ridiculous, whatever Stanley said. <laughs> I was crazy. blown away. But So your investment, you're you're looking at a day's worth of work for your guys, right? You sacrifice that, you make the commitment to be here. So you're probably all in every bit of five grand your cost. Is it worth it? Definitely, yeah. Looks absolutely amazing. Looks amazing. I love so what I love about this is we were a little little antsy about putting it back here, but we tied in two flower beds that your wife had concerns about removing. It ties in these two trees together. It created a destination point, but what do you think? We had a couple of options around the house, the front yard, the backyard. Good decision, bad decision to put it right here and kind of tie this uh, area together. I think this is a great decision. This is a way better canvas area than the, the front yard would have been. Yeah. 
hands down, this is a, the best spot we could have picked, I think. Yeah, we give us a yard, we'll find a spot for it. We could have made the front yard look awesome, right? Right. But it's a good feeling when you hit the mark, when you hit the bullseye, you know, with the right size, the right scale, it ties everything together. We kept Melissa happy. She's got blood, sweat, and tears in beds. They still need to come up here, but she was a little concerned, right? Yeah. I love how it's all tied together. I think what's cool about it too, Chris, is inevitably you, when you're on a sales consultation, are going to be faced with the same thing that Chris and I faced with you and Melissa coming out and kind of hemming and hawing about the location right. and you trusting in us. When we got here, you had your mind set on I somewhere did. in the front yard, right? Yep. Same spot as the old old one up there, but right. yeah. But inevitably you trusted us in our experience in designing and creating water features and where we found to be some of the best spots to really maximize the interactivity and the enjoyment with the water feature. Is it safe to say you couldn't be happier with where it's at now? Yeah, I think it's a great spot and it's gonna draw us back here now. And to hammer in that point, you're gonna be in that same position we were in. Exactly. And you're you gonna be like tools. struggling, like, oh, that's why we always say, don't give a customer what they ask for, give them what they want. You've live it now, you know where they need it, right off of the deck, right off of the patio, and you're gonna have that same struggle with, oh man, I know, I understand it's your money. I understand it's your commitment, you're living with it, but trust me when I say this, we think you're really gonna love it back here. Tim, you, Stanley, have been fantastic. And Chris and I really appreciate the opportunity to come up and help get you guys through this process. Alex, Joey, Blaine, appreciate everything. <laughs> It, it does look incredible, you know, and I think what's fun is we learned a lot, but what do you think your guys learned? I don't know, let's go, let's let's go, go talk, talk to them. Yeah. Joey, Alex, what do you guys think, man? I think it turned out great. Yeah. I mean, I helped him for four or five days up in the front, helped him get it ready to had his heart set on it going up there. And I also agree, I think this is a great spot back here. Yeah, the labor part of it, I really thought, gosh, we're gonna dig this by hand when we got an excavator back there. And wow, it went real quick, real easy, real slick. Yeah. Like you guys said, I thought it was pretty fun too. It wasn't, wasn't too labor intensive, so I had fun with it. You guys did a fantastic job. Look, the birds are already <laughs> getting in there. And Tim, like, I asked you earlier in the truck, but let's ask him in front of these guys, but who do you think out of your team is probably the most fired up about getting into water features? I'm pretty fired up about it now after, I mean, this sparks something in you when you build these. And I think Alex would be fired up too. Yeah. I mean, this is something you can get really creative with. I'm kind of one of those guys that I like the moss logs. I like the old rustic kind of look to it, you know, the natural feel. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you can get really creative with this and kind of create something out of like a labor of love, you know, rather than just having to do it. It's work. I got come do it this is kind of I would enjoy doing this and at the end of the day the profits that's great also bonus but I would love doing these you know it's just a matter of selling them getting them in the ground and uh, continuing to gain customers from it Alex you and I had met it at one of the academies but Joey this is your first time yeah. being introduced to water features or anything aquascape what did you think yo I thought it was pretty cool I thought it came together really nicely so you know kind of new for me like you saying I've never done it before so kind of done landscaping Thing, so it wasn't too hard to catch on if you've done that kind of work before so you guys absolutely nailed it you got a good team good group of guys you know you two and then blaine you know and it was just it was a lot of fun um and super glad that you guys are doing it right thank yeah. you so much can't thank, thank you, you so much can't thank can't you wait. guys enough for coming here's some here. stories we're gonna see you at pandemonium this summer right with a thousand other contractors i bet right all right you got it on camera <laughs> guys what a fun project the rain is starting to fall we finished up it looks absolutely incredible Tim and Stanley and then their crew of Blaine, Alex, Joey did a fantastic job working alongside, learning throughout the process and completely hitting the bullseye on this pond. If you guys enjoyed this episode, let us know in the comments section below. There's going to be all the links to all the different products we used. And don't forget to head over to Stanley, the Dirt Monkeys channel. Subscribe to him. And if you haven't already, subscribe to us as well. We'll see you later next time.